Hello everyone, happy Friday and welcome to another edition of Brain Scratch. I have to give a quick shout out to our researcher on this topic, Dandy of Warhols One. Thank you so much for contributing all this information on this topic, I really appreciate it. And thank you guys for joining me here today so we can discuss the case of Cindy James. Now, you know that I typically like to start with the Wikipedia article. I did see some references to her Wikipedia article from other websites. However, when I went there, I saw that it was no longer in existence. And uh, just so you get kind of a feeling about what happens on Wikipedia, I wanted to show this articles for deletion post about her particular case. And here they kind of sum it up. None of the three sources are good sources and subject is not notable in my opinion. So just know that um, while I do appreciate Wikipedia and I always look to it as a source of popular information, kind of the people's story about a particular case, a lot of cases um, aren't featured there. We bumped into this uh, once before on an investigation into Denver International Airport that I had done. Um, and it can be a bit subjective in terms of what makes a case go away. Now this case is tough because it's from 1989. So as you can imagine, finding source information for a case like that can be a bit challenging. Uh, however, there were multiple news segments done on this that you can find online. Uh, it was even featured on Unsolved Mysteries. There are official records in some form in terms of we know that there was a police investigation. Of course, those records are not currently public from any searching that um, I was able to dig up. But just know that there are certain cases that are fallen out of the public eye and this is kind of what happens. At some point someone decides, hey, there's just not enough good information about this case and we don't think this case is important enough to report on, so we're going to delete the entire article. So that is what happened to Wikipedia. That being said, as I mentioned, there's tons of articles about this case. Here is a picture of Cindy James and this is from an article on vancourier.com. Um, this takes place in Canada. And this is actually from a list of the seven creepiest unsolved mysteries um, from Canada. And they rank this one pretty high. Let's go into their description of the events here. In June 1989, the body of Cindy James, a 44-year-old nurse, was found in the yard of an abandoned house in Richmond. She had been drugged and strangled while her hands and feet had been tied behind her back. The autopsy report indicated she died of an overdose of morphine and other drugs, and despite being hogtied, her death was ruled a suicide by the RCMP, that's the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. But her family never believed this was a suicide. For more than six years leading up to her murder, James had reported hundreds of harassment incidents to the police and to her family. We're going to jump the article here a little bit. Uh, the short of it is, soon after leaving her husband in 1981, James started receiving threatening phone calls. The police started to investigate, but over the next several months the harassment increased. She reported prowlers outside her house at night, windows were smashed, and phones, phone cords were cut. We're going to get some better detail from a different source in terms of some of the harassment information. But um, just to clarify a few points, I believe that the harassment started four months after she left her husband. Um, she did leave her husband, and her husband was notably older than her. He was 18 years older than her, and they got married when she was 19. Uh, he also happened to be a psychiatrist, so um, definitely some interesting pieces of the story. How could someone uh, drug themselves and then hogtie themselves? How did the police view this as an, uh, a suicide? Uh, doesn't make a lot of sense, especially when the official result on the coroner's report was that the cause of death could not be determined. So some big twists and turns in this case. And elements that just seem familiar kind of calls back to the Gareth Williams case a little bit about you know him putting himself in the bag. Well, how did he do that? And then how did he succumb to what happened? Um, definitely some big questions in this Cindy James case as well. Is she potentially doing this herself? Is this um, done by someone that was possibly her ex-husband or knew about that or maybe some other type of stalker? There's a lot of different ways to look at this case. Her sister wrote a book recently, and her sister's name is Melanie Hack, and you can see at melaniehack.com she's put together a website with a bunch of resources. We're going to refer to it a few times during this process, but for the first one, this is actually right out of her book. 
I have been tormented and harassed by someone who knows me well enough to know what will really hurt me, she wrote of her living nightmare. She endured seven major physical assaults, including kidnapping and several attempted murders, had her arms tied up tightly behind her and electrical tape sealed over her mouth, was injected with drugs, held at knife point, slashed, stabbed, sexually violated, and time after time, strangled to near death with black nylon pantyhose. In addition, she was the object of harassment that included obscene and threatening phone calls, letters, and notes made of words cut from newspaper, messages left on her car windshield with a picture of a covered corpse being wheeled into a morgue on a stretcher, raw meat delivered, and dead cats left in and around her house, some with string around their necks and a note nearby saying, you're next. Damage to her property, broken windows, a slashed pillow, cut phone wires, and arson. Even her beloved dog Heidi had been found shaking with fright and sitting in her own feces, allegedly with cord wound tightly around her neck. The harassment would appear to cease for brief periods, then return, so Cindy never knew when something horrible would happen, so she had to be constantly alert, careful, and watchful. In her journal, she screamed at God, how could you let this go on? And this is truly a nightmare. I believe that this is um, something that many women are fearful of, that at some point you might pick up some type of stalker or someone that is looking to do you harm, and more than just do you harm, to terrify you along the way. And that appears to be what's the case um, going on here, at least from Cindy and her sister's own uh, point of view. Now, you know, I don't usually like showing photos um, that are graphic in nature on Brain Scratch. I think this is minorly graphic, uh, no blood or anything like that. But I did want to point out, this is the position that she was found in. Um, you can see her feet are tied, her hands are behind her back. There is some question about this jacket. Um, some people seem to think that she may have laid this jacket down and was kneeling on it when she hogtied herself and that after she died she kind of fell over off the jacket. Um, for me personally, I don't think she's in the right position to have quite fallen over. Um, unless, I guess she could have been sitting on it if she was sitting on the jacket. But if she was sitting on the jacket, how was she hogtying herself with her feet and her hands like that? Um, I'm just really uncertain. But this is the position she was found in. Um, some people have also talked about her feet. She's obviously not wearing shoes. She was found over a mile and a half away from her car. Her car was parked in a shopping center. And some people are saying, well, if she walked a mile and a half, how come her feet are not more dirty? Um, here, it looks like there might be some dirt or a little, there's a little darkness going on here. But on one of the news reports I saw, they actually blew the photo up. And that is mostly what I can tell, or for what I can see, that is mostly shadow and shading. Uh, the bottom of her foot actually looked relatively clean in the blown up photo. And if you check the news reports in the links down in the description box, you'll run into that same footage and see when they zoom in on the photo. Uh, it does look a bit different than, it's, than it looks here on screen. This is one of the threatening notes that was left. Just very simple, I see you. You can see there's a picture of someone being strangled. There's a picture of a knife. Um, definitely scary, not anything I would like to receive myself. Um, to go into one of the, the events that happened, we're going to review this information from her friend, Agnes Woodcock. She told me many times that he wanted to scare her to death. She said, he doesn't want to kill me, he wants to scare me to death. One night, Agnes dropped by Cindy's house for a visit. I went up and knocked on the door. There was no answer. I assumed she was having her bath. She did every night. And I thought I heard something. I wasn't sure what it was. When Agnes investigated, she came across Cindy outside. I found her crouched down with a nylon tied tightly around her neck. Cindy, Cindy said she'd gone out to the garage to get a box, and someone grabbed her from behind. All she saw were white sneakers. Cindy moved to a new house, painted the car, and changed her last name. She also hired a private investigator, Ozzy Caban. The police continued their investigation and questioned Cindy several times. According to Ozzy Caban, she wouldn't tell them the entire story. She would be evasive, she would withhold information, and she simply would not act as a normal victim would act. And I can see where a police officer would have tremendous amount of problem believing her story. Um, Ozzy comes up frequently when you research this case, 
And it is worth noting, he does believe she was actually murdered. He does not find it feasible that she injected herself. Um, there was a puncture found in her arm, although some people are saying that there were also tablets found in her stomach. Um, so we're not sure if she was injected with morphine, um, given another type of drug, but he is pretty well convinced that she couldn't have done that, been under the influence of these narcotics, and then managed to tie those knots behind her back. They had some type of hearing on this case, and they had a knot expert come in. Um, apparently he was able to tie himself uh, in that manner, however, he said that he was using different knots than were found at the crime scene and he was able to do it in about three minutes but it is worth noting obviously he wasn't under um, any type of drugs you know especially with a, a bunch of morphine i've seen some reports saying that it was 10 times the lethal dose amount floating around in her body i've seen other conflicting information that says that um, morphine varies a lot from person to person and that those amounts can't really be um, figured out that easily so uh, definitely a lot of conflicting info in this and that's kind of what's unfortunate about this case um, not having as good of records or modern technology around it as we have now uh, there is just there's what feels like a lot of storytelling that's happening around this case and unfortunately that seems to be what's lasted all of this time so a lot of what we're looking at i have to take with a huge grain of salt because it is largely um, pieces of hearsay and quotes from people that are close to the issue, but of course we don't have um, we don't have any information directly from Cindy about this. There is no suicide note. Um, she seemed to love her family very much, so there is some question about would she really do this? Would she really put her family through these feelings and all this torment of their daughter being harassed and eventually murdered? Um, and there are some interesting twists that happen in her story. She did wind up eventually um, being put in a mental hospital for a stretch of, I believe it was 10 weeks, if I recall correctly. It's kind of hard because you see all this information in different pieces. Um, and the doctor there was worried that she was suicidal. I saw one thing that appeared to be a quote from a writing of hers that did say that she should just end it so that she could um, you know, not have to go through this anymore. Um, so there is definitely some type of argument that she might have been in a mental state where she was compromised and perhaps she was looking to harm herself in some way. What works against that is considering that she was married to a psychiatrist for 20 years. Um, there is nothing that I can find where he is noting any signs of her struggling in any way like that during their marriage. Um, she herself, uh, I believe she worked as a pediatric nurse, um, so she is definitely aware of health, and it's just, I don't know, there's a lot of aspects of this case where I really am scratching my brain, because I don't know how to even find more information to review this. Um, that being said, there are, from what I can see, three books that have been published, one from her sister and uh, two other ones that were published very close to when the event actually happened. So those might be good sources for additional information. Back to her sister's website, um, she has a page here on the threats. And if we look down here, we can see here are some more pictures of the notes that were left. Um, what's interesting to me, thinking about how these notes are constructed, is if she was doing this herself, uh, I believe police or possibly her private investigator might have found the pieces of newsprint or magazines where the stuff was cut out from. Um, I did see an interview with her private investigator and he was saying that he was going through her trash. He was basically trying to figure this out for himself. Was she doing this to herself or was this someone else doing it? And he could not come to the conclusion that she was doing this to herself. As a matter of fact, um, you know, frequently her phone lines had been cut, so he set up a two-way radio system with her. He heard some strange noises over it. He rushed to the house. He kicked down the door. He found her, uh, I believe, in her kitchen. She had been stabbed with a paring knife actually through her hand, and there was a note that was um, stabbed through as well, uh, one, a note quite like one of these and she had cuts all over herself, including on her head. Uh, I believe that she also had the nylon wrapped around her neck at that point. 
And that's another thing that I haven't found good information from, and who knows, this might be in the police records, but the nylons, could they be identified as being hers? Were they her size? Um, I know that one twist that her sister had found out was that at least on the last day when she went out, I believe it was May 25th, 1989, she cashed her check, she went shopping somewhere, and then they found her car with her blood on the outside, I believe on the door of it. Um, several items from her purse were under the car, I believe including some credit cards. And then, like I said, she was a mile and a half away. Um, her sister found the receipt from that day of shopping, and there was no nylons on the receipt. So where did the nylons come from is a big question. Where did the syringe that puncture her go is another question. Um, I saw some counts on the amount of pills that might have been found in her stomach. We're talking more than a dozen, so where is the glass or bottle of water that she would need to try to consume that much, or um, was she just popping them dry? I don't know, but there's a lot of questions in particular about the scene where she was found and just missing things. Where are her shoes? Um, there is also some question about why it took two weeks for her body to be found there because apparently this was, it was an abandoned house, but it was used by teenagers a lot that would party there. Um, her body could be seen by some walkways that were close by there. And of course, once she started decomposing, there should have been a smell that should have attracted some attention. So some people believe that, including her private investigator, that that was a dumping site, that she did at not actually die there. She might have been held somewhere else, something else happened to her, and then she was taken there and dropped. That being said, um, I believe there are no signs of any type of sexual assault on the body, um, but it is worth noting in that piece I read from her sister that she does say that there was some type of um, sexual assaults that occurred. So, very strange. Once again, we just find information in this case that has us going this way, looking that way, and not knowing where the heck we are, but let's proceed. Um, this is a pretty sturdy piece of info. This is tape of an actual phone call that was recorded to her. And here it's in quotes, just in case you couldn't make it out. Cindy dead meat soon. Um, I've read on a few different forums about this. Reddit has a lot of information about this. And some people believe that they are hearing a woman trying to mask her voice in that tape. And I tend to agree with them. Um, that, to me, sounds a lot like a woman or maybe a prepubescent boy um, trying to mask their voice in a, in a whisper, but it's not a hushed whisper. It's their vocal cords are actually kicking, and I can kind of, at least from what I hear, um, it, that's what it seems like to me. So once again, that puts some suspicion and kind of, it's weird. It's almost like you keep a scorecard in this case, and for every tick you put on the side that this is a homicide, you find this information where you're like, wow, this really looks like this could potentially be a suicide or something she had set up herself. You have to consider these seven different assaults, these times that she's found by people that are watching her and friends of hers. I mean, did she know that her friend was coming over that day? Was that a um, attempt at suicide that maybe did not come all the way through? She was still um, conscious enough to be resuscitated when her friend showed up. It is very interesting that the same pattern is showing up of her being choked. However, the assault to her is changing a little bit. We have, um, you know, the knife in her hand in the kitchen. When her body is found, we're looking at drugs and being hogtied, um, almost as if the nylon around the neck is more of a signature or might mean something to her in some way. For example, I don't know if she was wearing black nylons when she met someone. Um, something along those lines. There's just something about black nylons around the neck and the fact that even in her death, that was not found to be the cause. It was the drug overdose that um, it seems to have, that actually took her out, um, not necessarily the nylon that was tied around her neck. And that raises a question of, 
if you know you're going to murder someone and you're going to take them out with drugs, why are you going to tie this nylon around their neck? And that's why I keep looking back at this as some type of calling card, but I don't think it's like a mass murderer, serial killer's calling card where he's going to go kill a bunch of other people using black nylons around their neck. There's something about it for me that seems to suggest this was something personal between them and her. Um, or if she is suffering some, from some type of multiple personality thing, which is one of the theories, her and herself. It just it's, it's a clear indicator for me in just my limited experience. It's some type of indicator of more of a message to her than it is a device to actually take her out. Obviously, if she was attacked seven times, it wasn't a good device for, for, for finishing the job. Um, so, let's continue. This is from one of the news segments. Um, just a little information from her mother. She was so afraid to tell me something. And she said, uh, I need help badly, but I can't tell you, Mom. If I do, I'm afraid for you. And I would say to her, don't let it get you down. Fight, fight, damn it, girl, fight. Now, unfortunately, both of her parents have since passed. Um, there was some interesting developments around her father uh, had fallen ill and I think he knew his time was coming and he was promising that he knew more information about this case and that he was going to release it on his deathbed. Now, I don't know if that information ever came out. I saw it referred to um, by Melanie Hack, her sister, and I don't know if she might have included it in her book, but I have not been able to find any public information about what her father may have said on his deathbed. If what her mother is saying here is correct, that would lead me to believe a few things. Um, if her mother would be at risk just by knowing the information, possibly if her father was related to it in some way. Um, you know, there's all kinds of different things that could have happened in the, in, maybe in her childhood, um, something along those lines, or possibly law enforcement. And that is, of course, a theory that comes up quite frequently when we look at cases like this. But this case might have a little more reason to look at that a bit stronger than most. Once again, back at MelanieHack.com, this is another news clip, but just a little interesting piece I found in it here. The inquest opened with testimony from the first investigating officer James dealt with on a regular basis, Vancouver Police Constable Pat McBride. He first investigated a complaint of harassing phone calls in the fall of 1982. McBride continued to investigate harassment and moved into the house for one month in November 1982. He continued to be the investigating officer while living in the house and having a close relationship with James. What? I could not believe when I bumped into that information. And of course, close relationship has to be better defined. Um, but a cop is investigating calls of harassment and decides to move into the house with her and live there for a month? What is going on there? So let's take a look and see if we can find about, out about this relationship. This is from thetroublewithjustice.com who um, did a really good write-up on this and I highly recommend you check it out. Um, it's written very objectively. I really like how they are telling this story all together. And here's just a little piece of it. Cindy also had a lover named Pat McBride who happened to be a cop. The police suspected him and make peace uh, Make Peace is her former husband, who uh, is also recently deceased. Well, um, just over two years ago now. Died December 4th, 2013. Here's a picture of him. Uh, what is interesting is the police were looking at Roy Make Peace as a pot potential suspect. Um, they even had her call him, and they recorded the call where she's accusing him. He flat out denies it, and he received a threatening call as well from this mysterious whisper voice. So once again, I don't know what side you put that tick mark if that means we were talking potential homicide and the guy called her ex-husband for some reason, or if we're looking at potential suicide and as part of this fictionalized world or um, kind of mind trap that she's stuck in, uh, this person called and left this message for Roy. 
But back to Pat McBride. <clears throat> the police suspected him and Makepeace, but had no concrete evidence against either one of them. The evidence in the case was quite contradictory and incomplete and very baffling, but the police opted to blame Cindy. Her ex-husband came to believe that Cindy had multiple personalities and was unaware that she was tormenting herself. She adored her dog and her parents and would have never tortured them willingly. Her father states that the investigation was never aimed at finding a perpetrator, but at pinning the responsibility on his daughter. And just one more piece of info for us to look at on this Pat McBride issue. This is from Reddit, and we have to take this with a huge grain of salt because we don't have any thing to confirm this person's identity. This was submitted two years ago by VLU77. Forgot to add that my uncle was a suspect. And what a lot of the available reading on the case fails to mention is that years after, after Cindy turned up dead, my uncle Pat McBride of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police was stripped of his badge for, what I was told, were similar attacks or threats of attacks on other women. He's since passed, so I can't ask him about it, though I don't think I would. He always scared me a little. Once again, I think we have to take that with a huge grain of salt. I did some searching, trying to find information on RMCP Pat McBride. Um, nothing turned up, so I can't even validate that he was kicked out of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police um, or discharged in any type of way. Um, or even that he's deceased. Quite honestly, Pat McBride is a little bit of a common name and I was getting many hits in law enforcement for Pat McBride that were not this guy. Um, so I think that's where we come down to the theories and I'm gonna hand them over to you. Theory number one, we've got some potential stalker. This is a homicide. This person was a long-term stalker. I mean, was literally at her for six and a half years several attempts to kill her that either failed or they were attempts to bring her to near death and let her live and then eventually he does kill her um, scenario number two this is a woman that was definitely struggling with some type of mental disorder particularly after her divorce maybe it's something that appeared later in life that just did not affect her as seriously when she was young maybe it took a certain type of trauma to activate it um, and maybe she was concocting this in some way, and as her ex-husband thinks, she might not even be aware of it, almost like a true split personality um, situation where at times she was just taken over by this other person that was doing this to herself. And from the official information that came out of the RCMP, they could never find anything to identify that anyone else had been involved in any of these instances. There was two cases where her house was burnt. In one of the cases in particular, other people were in the house staying with her at the time. And uh, she went and woke one of them up. She said, I think I heard something downstairs. They went down to investigate and her basement was on fire. In that case, when the police investigated, they could not find any point of entry. They couldn't find any fingerprints. Even dust had not been disturbed on the windowsills. So it's one of those things. You either have to believe the evidence that the police were not able to find, or you could make the assumption that they weren't looking hard. They had already written her off. Possibly um, her relationship with Pat McBride may have undermined her at some point. Uh, you have to wonder, you know, if I get in an intimate relationship with someone and I move in with them, uh, typically I don't live with them only for one month. So what did Pat learn in that month? What made him move out? Did that relationship continue past that point? I can't really find good information on any of that. Um, and is there some potential that Pat McBride is the guy that actually was doing all this? Um, he would certainly know police procedures. Uh, the police had her house under surveillance for certain periods of time, and during those periods of time, there were no attacks. How could that happen if the perpetrator was a cop and maybe knew about those surveillance periods, he could easily avoid them? Um, some other people think that even if it was not a cop, the guy could just have noticed that the house was under surveillance and not attacked at that point. Um, very, very odd. Um, is there a third situation? You know, her ex-husband, I think it's pretty interesting that this starts four months after she leaves him uh, and doesn't seem to let up for a period of years. If, if the events are to be believed at face value, you would think this is someone that was 
probably hurt by her pretty bad. And I believe he would be looked at as a suspect in that case. But we know the police did investigate him for many years, did not find any cause to believe that he was the suspect in this. Uh, we know that at least Cindy did suspect him of it, but um, did she hold that conviction until the end of her life? I'm really not certain. So I think that's about it. This is where I'm going to turn it over to you guys. And I really need your help on this case because, like I said, it, a lot of it is down to hearsay at this point, but there's a lot of it out there. Um, I can't possibly review it all. And even with the help of a researcher, once again, thank you to Dandy of Warhols One, um, we can't do all of this on our own. It is really um, best when we kind of crowdsource this, hand it over to you guys, and please dig up some information, drop it in the comments below. Um, hopefully you can find some new links and maybe we can shed some more light on this pretty disturbing case. Um, there's few cases I've come across that are really this type of brain scratcher, um, but this is certainly one of them. I really don't know what to believe. I, th I'm, I am just about completely 50-50 on this right now. I really, I really could believe either direction of this is someone else doing it to her and then the question is, who is it? Um, or this is something that she had done to herself. And then the question at that point is, is she really aware of it? Or are she, is she trying to stage someone? Is she trying to frame someone for her own demise? Like maybe she wants to get back at her ex-husband, but why? She left him. There's just parts of it that, it's like a puzzle that many pieces just don't fit into and the box is just full of these pieces. <laughs> so that is Brain Scratch for this week. Thank you all for joining me, and I will catch you on the next show on the Geek and Dorks channel. Take care, everyone.